Okay, so we're going to begin uh, our lesson tonight with the last epoch, uh, the apostolic epoch of biblical, biblical revelation. Our um, goal all along was to again, follow this concept of redemption right? because this is basically a Bible survey uh, course. So to follow the idea of redemption from Genesis all the way through the Bible uh, so that you get a good sense of, of the message of the Bible, the message of salvation, and it will help you better understand, I think, each and every book of the Bible, uh, mm. if you are able to put its content inside of one of these epochs, and then you are aware of these uh, pertinent issues that we've lifted up uh, over the course of the last two months about uh, that epoch, it will help your understanding and interpretation of the word of God. So that when we go back Later on, if we pick up a book and we go to study it, you will have already some archive information that will uh, help to, I think, focus uh, your study and your reading so that uh, the message, when you can see this message in the light of what God has done in human history to redeem mankind. Uh, it will make a whole lot more sense, all right? Uh, and so we come tonight to the final epoch, again, the, the apostolic epoch of biblical revelation. And it may, you know, I guess I want us to know that that biblical revelation did not end with the prophetic age with the birth of Jesus. Because what God does in human history doesn't end with Jesus' birth. It actually continues until his second coming. Mm -hmm. And so if we had stopped in the prophetic age, we would have been in bad shape. All right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And so all of the Old Testament prophecies were all looking towards what would happen in what we're calling now the apostolic uh, epoch. And we call it apostolic simply because the apostles were the main messengers of that divine revelation. And not only were they, they the messengers, they were the source of most of the content. And, and in many cases, they were the authors of that content. So uh, it gives us a much clearer uh, and a closer look at the revelation that they're trying to give us. So when we, when we close the prophetic age, uh, there really is only one major change in the people of God after they returned from exile from before they went in. And that is that before that when they came back, they were finally, ultimately and completely broken of the tendency towards idolatry. Right? They would, you know, the, the, the Jews have a phrase, they say never again. All right. They they use that about the Holocaust, but they also I, I think began that that thinking after the uh, exile, that never again would they uh, fall for idol gods. They, they, they would worship uh, the one God. Now, it's important for us to know that we can't understand fully the revelation of God in the Old Testament without understanding what he does in the New Testament. And the converse is also true. We can't understand the New Testament if we separate it from the Old Testament. Okay. 
Uh, there, there may be a couple of people on this line now. I think Leilani's one of them who may remember when I first came to Lilydale, uh, one of the uh, major statements of the church uh, was that we believe in the New Testament as the all-sufficient rule of faith and practice. And the first chance I got. I know you changed that. I changed it. <laughs> I had the church change it. I said, no, mm. we believe the whole Bible. The whole Bible. Right. I think you put it in a little booklet, didn't you? You put it yeah, in a little booklet. In, yeah, put it in okay. a booklet. Yeah. The whole Bible is, the, uh, is what we accept as the all-sufficient rule of faith and practice. We don't understand how to practice New Testament faith without a clear understanding of the Old Testament revelation. Because together, the Old Testament and the New Testament constitute one message, and not two right. messages. Yes. It is Amen. one message that centers on Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the incarnate Son of God. That's right. So as we begin uh, looking at this apostolic age, there, there are some things that I, I want to, to, to uh, lift up, basically to look at the New Testament and to see how it corresponds and or uh, fulfills that which was anticipated and or prophesied in the Old Testament. So the first thing... I want to share with you is the fact that that in the New Testament, Christ fulfills Old Testament scripture. Come on, man. Yes. Yes. Right. All right. And and it's interesting that we see that most clearly in what is probably the closest book to the Old Testament in the New Testament, and that's the book of Hebrews. Mm, okay. Okay. In the book of Hebrews. All through that book, it reminds us that not only does Jesus fulfill it, but in in by in 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 the most cases, he is well. In all cases, he is superior to everything that they established by way of continuing the revelation in the Old Testament. Christ in the New Testament is superior to all that they did in the new, in the old. Mm -hmm. So when you read Hebrews chapter 11, which is, we call that the faith chapter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, gives us that list of all these faith heroes. What, what that chapter does is it basically takes us all the way back to the Old Testament so that we can understand the message of Christ in the New Testament. Right, it tells us about Noah, about Abraham mm -hmm. and Sarah. It just takes us down that list and litany of Old Testament heroes and reminds us that what they did, they did looking forward to what God had promised them. Mm -hmm. And so when we get to the New Testament, what we discover is we discover a Christ who is the fulfillment of all that God promised them in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the rest of that book demonstrates how Jesus uh, is everything that Moses and the prophets said that the Messiah would be. So there, there's a couple passages of scripture, well, I got five of them here, all in Hebrews, that, that I think we ought to take a real quick look at. Uh, I don't know if we, we need to read all of it, but uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, starting with verse 14, we are shown the fact that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. Okay. But he says in 2.14, for as, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Right? So he, right. he is a descendant of Abraham. Mm -hmm. It goes on down to verse 18. He says, for in him, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So Christ is shown as a descendant of, of Abraham. In chapter 7 of Hebrews, verses 26 through 28, we are instructed that Jesus Christ is the perfect high priest. In the Old Testament, you remember we talked about the book of Leviticus. Yeah. Right. How they established the temple worship, right? Or the tabernacle mm -hmm. worship in Leviticus. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about those laws, the moral law, the ceremonial law, all right? Oh, yeah. The high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies once a year to make atonement mm -hmm. for the sins. And all of those sacrifices that they did, those were all temporary things looking forward to when God would provide that Redeemer who then would make all of that sacrifice unnecessary. Hmm. So in chapter 7, starting with verse 26, he says, For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Hmm. Needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Mm -hmm. so we are reminded then that Jesus is even superior to the high priest of the Old Testament. He is the perfect high priest that fits the mold of the promised redeemer. Mm -hmm. In chapter 9, Verses 26 through 28. It's interesting, those same verses. Right. Uh, we, are, we are instructed that Jesus is also that perfect sacrificial lamb. Because again, for, for sin and for atonement and for forgiveness, there had to be the shedding of blood. There had to be the sacrifice of the lamb. In verse 26, he says, For then must he often have suffered, since the foundation of the world, right? So he's suffering from the beginning on our behalf. But now, once in the end of the world, had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay. So Jesus becomes that perfect sacrifice. Now, on the day of atonement in the Holy of Holies, the only person that could go in there was the priest, the high priest, mm -hmm. right? And he had to make atonement for his own sins and then make atonement for the sins of the nation. Mm -hmm. The book of Hebrews, again, the, this uh, apostolic epoch teaches us that Jesus Christ is the new way into entry into the Holy of Holies. Now, there are a lot of things. When you, you read the crucifixion stories, Mm -hmm. When the narratives, when Jesus died, it says the veil of the temple was rent, torn in half, right, top to the bottom, right, not from the bottom to the top, and that veil is what separated the holy of holies from the holy place. Yes. When Jesus yeah. died, that veil is torn apart because he becomes that new entry into the holy of holies. And so in chapter 9 of Hebrews, starting with verse 11, he says, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. Book of Hebrews is, is, is not one of those well-read books by most Christians, but it if you ever want to get, get a clear picture of what Jesus did to redeem us, it is in this book. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And then again, you go back to that 11th chapter, that book of that chapter of, of hero, heroes, uh, verse 10 lets us know that all of those heroes that they listed out, Dead. they died, but they lived looking in anticipation of the redemption to come. So in verse 10 of chapter 11, uh, again, when he gets to Abraham, as we go back to Abraham's seed, he says, for he looked for a city which mm. has foundations, whose builder and, and maker is God. Is God. Amen. So he's anticipating uh, something that is not made of human hands, right? Mm. Right. Now, the same is true about all of the writings in the New Testament. All of the apostolic writings bear witness to the continuity between all of those epochs in the Old Testament that reveal to us what God has done to redeem us and Jesus Christ as the culminating event or the culminating person that all of those epochs and all of those other events and all of those other prophecies meet together in one place, in one person, in one event. And that is uh, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, just to your construction of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew comes first. And most Bible students know that the Gospel of Matthew is not the first Gospel written. First gospel. That's right. All right. Mark is the first Gospel written. But Matthew comes first so that we understand that the New Testament is a continuation of the Old Testament. Yeah. So what Matthew does is he gives us that genealogy. And he goes back a thousand years and connects Jesus to David. Then he reaches back 2,000 years and connects Jesus to Abraham. John takes it a step further in his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Right? So John reaches all the way back to the beginning with the word with God. And I think the word, word, all right, in the Greek is logos. But uh, even our English understanding of it is interesting, I think, uh, when you consider that the best way to communicate clearly with another human being is through words. Through words. Right? Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but sometimes when I take uh, young people out and we go to dinner, we're sitting around the table and they're all on their phones texting. <laughs> I, I, you know, and I say, well, something's wrong with this. We all sitting at the same table and nobody's talking to anybody. They're all texting, Right? Right. I find out they're texting each other. They're sitting right there at the table. Talking to each other. other. That's right. That's what right. they do. Instead of just talking to each other. Right. Right. Now, some of the folks who are who are a little late, lately, later come comers to technology understand that we when we don't know all of the rules, sometimes our texting and our email do, does not accurately communicate our feelings. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Right. Exactly. Uh, I think she's on the line today. And I, I don't want to embarrass her, but I remember you when are absolutely was right. mission president and she used to send out a lot. I think she sent out about 700 emails. But, but early on, she would send emails out in all caps. Mm -hmm. So yep. I, had, I had to send her a note. That she was fussing at everybody. You know that when you say that, all caps that mean you're shouting at everybody. Screaming yeah. yeah. That you're mad yeah. at folks. And she said, Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> right. yeah. She had to change her method of communication. All right. Yeah. So, but but word is the most effective way to communicate between human beings. So right. when Jesus appears in person, John says he's the word in the beginning, what actually occurs is that we have the final and perfect communication taking place because we have word made flesh. flesh. Come on now. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not to feel preach coming on. <laughs> right? Okay. We have, okay. We have right. word made flesh. 
as 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 the most as the final communication and most perfect communication from God. Yeah. And then in Luke chapter 24, you really ought to read that one. Because Luke chapter 24, Jesus gives his own testimony. If all that other stuff from Hebrews and every and Matthew and John does not do it in Luke 24. Verse 25 and 26, Jesus gives his own testimony concerning himself as a culmination of Old Testament revelation, right? Right. right. He says there, then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's Old Testament, right? Right. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory mm, mm. and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Mm -hmm. He said, you all didn't believe it. You're slow to understand what the prophets said. But don't you know that I had to do all of this in order to come into my glory? And then he went back and took them through the whole Old Testament Thank so you, they could see him. In every situation. Yeah. yeah. Lord. That had to be some Bible class. Mm -hmm. right. Right. All right. The, the next thing I want to do, not only does, does he fulfill Old Testament revelation or prophecies, but Christ guarantees Old Testament promise. Maybe, maybe before I move to the second piece, let me ask if there's a question or comment. <coughs> Okay, he guarantees Old Testament promise. Right now, I'm going to play the devil's advocate and say if Jesus is indeed the culmination of the hopes and the promises of the Old Testament revelation, we should be able to discover specific references of that fact in the record of the New Testament. Mm hmm. Right? Okay. The writings of the apostles should be tested and interpreted in that light. Mm. Right? And I put the word tested in there because in, in the 21st century, we find ourselves now inundated with a whole new group of apostles. Mm -hmm. And they're writing all kinds of stuff, putting out all kinds of things. But if, if yes. you know, First of all, they don't really meet the biblical criteria for apostles. Well, not so. I was right. Right. Come on now, but, that's what, that was my question. But even if they did, they 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 have to be tested and tried by how uh, you know the hopes and dreams uh, of the Old Testament promises are fulfilled. We we need to find it in 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 the in their writings. <laughs> uh, uh, and and in and connected to the Old Testament, right? So the first, so what I want to do is I want to go back to all those epochs that we talked about, and then show you Jesus in every last one of them, right? Uh, That's why I said we might not make it through tonight. Okay. All right. First of all, in the in the Adamic epoch, epoch of Adam. We learn that Jesus Christ is the second Adam. Right. And he gave us the first Adam. The first Adam fell from grace. We were he was put out of the Garden of Eden, but he said, I'm going to send somebody else who will put you back. All right. Yeah. That's right. the second Adam. Right. right? right. So in, and Adam fell because of his disobedience, his stubbornness. Uh, and so you contrast Adam's disobedience. With, with, with Jesus, Jesus. faithful oh, obedience. Oh, right. Oh, right? Right. So mm -hmm. the failure of the first Adam, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the failure of the first Adam brought death. Okay. But the second Adam and his obedience brought okay. life. Mm -hmm. right. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 says, For as in Adam 
all got. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So he fulfills that criteria that God gave Adam in Genesis 3.15. All right, that you're not, you'll die. The day that you you eat, you'll surely die. You'll surely die. In Christ, that second Adam, all will surely be. Right? And we right. needed a second Adam. All right? Right. We needed somebody uh, from whom real righteousness could be inherited. Right? So in Romans chapter 5, <laughs> verse, verses 12 through 20, I'm not really going to read all of that, but in verse 12 he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed un upon all men, for that all have sinned. I'll drop down to verse 17, he says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one, Jesus Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. So all, all of life, that second Adam, that bringing, Christ becomes the second Adam, that, the one that was promised. Not right. set. Right? Okay. Uh, not Hezekiah, as some other folks said. It was Jesus. Right? right? Only Christ meets that uh, requirement. So we have to take the total life of Christ. You know, even as Baptist preachers sometimes, you know, I, I have some buddies that say, listen, if you preach a sermon on Sunday morning and you don't go to Calvary, you ain't preaching. Hmm. All right? But Calvary is not the whole story. Right. 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 It may be the culmination of the story, but it is the total life of Christ from birth to resurrection right. that becomes the guarantee of salvation for those of us who identify with him by faith. All right. All right. So, again, Jesus Christ in this Adamic epoch. He's the victor over demonic evil. Mm -hmm. yes. We talked about this uh, some time ago, right? When we went through the Adamic epoch. When you read Luke 4 about the temptation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything that Jesus did to yield not to temptation in the wilderness reversed everything that Adam did when he fell to temptation. Mm -hmm. okay. Jesus was, was tempted on the same areas that Adam was. And where Adam failed, the second Adam had victory over that evil. Mm, okay. The miracles, I mean every single one of them. Mm. The miracles of Jesus established the superiority of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of evil. Right? It was believed in the New Testament times that sickness and the like was caused by sin. So when Jesus would heal, it was a direct message that he had authority over sin and evil. He was superior to it. So he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He, he he freed folks from demons and he stilled the trouble seas. All of those things reverse the effects of the fall. If you remember before Adam and Eve ate, they were in perfect harmony in the garden. Yes. Right. No sickness, right. no death, no trouble. Right. right. Their work right. was full of joy. They didn't right. get tired working. They had to shovel no snow. <laughs> right. Oh, right. <laughs> but with the fall he says I'm going to make you have to earn your living by the sweat of your brow Yes. right you have to deal with thorns and thistles as you bring food out of the ground Lord, you're going to have to have pain in childbirth all of that stuff and Jesus in his miracles reverses 
all of that that occurred because of the fall. Ooh. Now, yeah. we know that we still have to deal with a whole lot of that stuff. That's because yep. the victory is not yet complete. Nope. But the issue of victory is no longer in the It's already settled. That's yes. what the Thank resurrection from the dead does. Thank you, Lord. Let's us know that this issue is no longer in doubt. Right? Satan is not trying to win the battle anymore. He's just trying to see how many he can take with him on his way down. Mm. Wow. I ain't going to be by his Right. Because there's, there's <laughs> one final revelation, mm. uh, one final act that has to happen. That is the return of Jesus in glory. Yes. Uh, uh, return, yeah, in, in Revelation chapter 11. Right? Now, the Noahic epoch. Right? We talked about two things. We talked about the flood. Mm -hmm. we talked about mm -hmm. the Tower of Babel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. The flood was a warning for every age. Right? And there are not that many New Testament references about the flood. But Matthew quotes Jesus as comparing the indifference of most of the people to Noah's warnings in his day to the general attitude that will prevail before the second coming, right? Now, one of the things that we, we did look at real clearly, and I think you can see it when you lay it side by side with what Jesus does, and that's the Tower of Babel. Because the Tower of Babel was essentially a revolt against heaven. Yes. Right? God said, be fruitful, multiply, spread out and replenish the earth. They said, we ain't spreading out. Nope. We're going to stay right here. That's We're going right. to build a house so we can get up to where you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what God did was he confounded their language and then he <laughs> scattered them abroad. Yeah. He prevented and, and, and it prevented an under, understanding and forced the people to scatter. With Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, mm. what you see is the reversal oh, okay. of what happened in the Tower of Babel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So yes. at Pentecost, yes. at the Tower of Babel, language is confused so nobody can communicate. Yes. yes. And folks who are, who are disobediently trying to be unified are then scattered abroad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But at Pentecost, people yeah. who were already yeah. scattered yeah. came yeah. together yeah. and yeah. understood yeah. in one yeah. language. language. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Everybody spoke in the same tongue, but what they heard was the same yeah. thing. Same. Come on, man. So what the Holy Spirit did is the Holy Spirit brought yeah. unity yeah. and a shared yeah. fellowship in the family of God. The mm. time of Babel broke up unity. Connection, right. Yes. And it scattered them across the world. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Thank you, God. So yes. Pentecost is a reversal of the power of Babel. Pentecost, yes. And, and I think that when it comes to us as believers in the body of Christ, who've now been unified in a common language, in a common voice, with a common message. Our relationship with Jesus has to transcend all other human distinctives like race, creed, uh, color, neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, whether you're affluent or not, none of that stuff. Red state, blue state, Democrat, Republican, none of that stuff should ever supersede our relationship with Jesus. That's the problem right. I have with the evangelical church right now. Right. They're allowing their politics to supersede their relation with Jesus. Jesus, that's true. That's we true. are one faith, one Lord, one baptism. The one baptism. Mm -hmm. All right. 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 Any comments, questions? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm moving pretty good. I might get this done. <laughs> All right. The, the next one was the Ab Abrahamic epoch. 
Again, Abraham uh, is the father of all beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what Paul does in the book of Galatians, you know, it, is it, so Galatians is one of those, just as Hebrews was one that showed, basically takes us back to Leviticus and all that stuff. What, mm -hmm. what Galatians does is it takes us back to Abraham. And uh, Paul makes it clear in Galatians chapter 3 that, that when God announced that all nations would be blessed through Abraham, it was the gospel in advance. Mm -hmm. right? I'm blessed. He says, so then they which, are, which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Right? The gospel of Jesus calls us into an inheritance of the promise to Abraham that God would be his God and the God of his descendants forever. When you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, he says, And if we be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, let me go back to that question that, that was asked a month ago. Who are the descendants of Abraham now? Mm. Remember that question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I intentionally did not answer it. Mm -hmm. Here is your answer. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. If ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. So Abraham's descendants today, Abraham's seed, are those faithful believers, those that remnant who are faithful believers until the coming of Christ and those since Christ who have placed their faith and their hope and their trust in him. Like Galatians 3.14 tells us that he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. That's verse 14, right? So we are Abraham's seed. When you go back mm -hmm. to Abraham, uh, Abrahamic epoch and you go back and, and look at it again, you'll, just, you'll, you'll be reminded Abraham had eight sons, mm -hmm. but only one of them shared his faith. Even his his uh, protege, Eleazar, his steward, he was a believer, but his other seven sons were not. They didn't share his faith. So the true children of Abraham were those who shared Abraham's faith. Okay. Mm. Right, and so he looked for a building not made with hand. Right, right. He looked for a building uh, whose builder and maker was God, and that correct. building is Christ Jesus. Right, and so he saw it. Right, John chapter eight says he saw it by faith. Right, right. Somebody right. had so Reverend, they yeah. had a second chance though. Because Thomas says because you said a few of them. Came of physical descendants, but remain true to their faith. Mm -hmm. then, then they have another chance to come again after he. Sure, sure, sure. That was the whole point of the remnant, the, the, right? Okay. Uh, that last five hundred years of the Old Testament, and even though, and it's called a remnant because they're a small minority mm -hmm. of the whole number, right? And when you read the Book of Revelation, you get the impression that that perhaps uh, even in there that even there that uh, in that in that uh, I, I ran across the question I want to answer uh, when you read in Revelation that that tribulation period he gives the Jews a second chance they have to go through the tribulation yeah. He put on them an extra burden. Right. Now, Mar Brother Marcel Curry, does he ask the original question? Ask the follow up. Does that mean that Abraham has no bottle of descendants? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. you, you can trace uh, 
you know, particularly now, you know, with with the uh, ancestry.com and all that stuff, the DNA trace, you can trace uh, back to Abraham and you can trace the Jews, many of them. Uh, but a lot of those out of, but a lot of those out of Eastern Europe still have the same trait uh, that they had in the, in the time of the Hebrews. Uh, and so, yeah, I think he still has the bodily descendants, uh, but I don't think that they are homogenous by that. I mean, all in one space, no. you know, uh, like as in the nation of Israel, they're not all in one space. Some of them are in Egypt, all right? Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are here. Uh, they're, they're scattered across uh, the globe. But right. yeah, he has bodily descendants. But when it comes to being the seed of Abraham, those who are faithful to, to his call, right? Mm. Okay. All right. So are we Yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. I thought somebody was asking the question. Might have was saying something. They were. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think she saw the answers in the chat, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. In the book of Romans, Paul compares the natural branch of a tree to the unnatural branches that are grafted into the tree to illustrate the relationship or the relation of Jews and Gentiles. Romans chapter 11. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, yeah. So we can, we could, we could carry this step further and say those who are, who are actually physical, bodily, descendants of Abraham, uh, we have been grafted into the body uh, through the blood of Jesus. Right? In verse 17, chapter 11 says, and if some of the branches be broken off, thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Right? Okay. We become part of the tree. We we get the same nourishment, the same nutrients. We share the same root, right? Oh, Though we've been grafted in. Right? That was the that really was a struggle that Paul had with the Jews as he began preaching the gospel, right? right. The, the one thing that I, that I really try to get across with all of this part is that if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most Christ fulfills Moses' testimony. Right? The Gospel of Matthew really demonstrates how Jesus fulfills that revelation given through Moses. Right? The birth of Jesus corresponds, and, and I might be pushing this a little bit, so you all forgive me. I don't want to, uh, Reverend Curry, I don't want to ice you moment. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I may be pushing it a little a little further, but uh, a little, little far. But when I read it, uh, it, it in, in my mind, it looks like the birth of Jesus corresponds to Israel's birth as a nation in the Exodus, right? As they come out of bondage, they 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 go through that wilderness experience. They come through uh, as a people of God. When when Jesus uh, flees, his family flees to Egypt. When Herod decides he wants to kill all the babies under two, mm -hmm. he returns back. Uh, Matthew says in chapter two, uh, verse fifteen. Uh, when Jesus comes back, uh, verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the baptism of Jesus in Jordan parallels uh, the baptism. That's what I call it. Baptism of Israel in the Red Sea. They come through the sea on dry ground into the promised land. 
Uh, now, certainly the temptation of Jesus uh, ought to cause us to, to remember the, the temptation of Israel in the wilderness, right, in Exodus chapter 12. Again, mm -hmm. same, same things. Uh, so it, it's Adam, uh, Israel in the wilderness, and then Jesus in the wilderness as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's no mistaking the fact that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount recorded in Matthew 5 through 7, really uh, reflects uh, quite a bit the giving of the law. Because what he does is he gives a new law. You hear him quite often saying, you have heard of old. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think. Right? And what he does is he gives us a new law. Right? Mm -hmm. Corresponding to the uh, law that was given to the, the children of Israel, right? So what Jesus did in his, in his ministry is he conformed to the law, but he fulfilled the law. You hear him say, I didn't come to destroy the law, right? Right. That the law might be fulfilled, right? right. So his life was a, was, a, was a lifestyle of conformity and fulfillment, right? So when they tried to make the law greater than uh, the one who becomes the epitome of that law, he had to say, no, here's what I say. The, here is how that law is fulfilled in Christ. Mm. So Christ fulfills the law. Right? When we studied it, we, we looked at three types of the law, the civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law, yes. right? Again, the civil right. law was designed to preserve Israel as a national entity uh, through which, I left the word out of here, through which the Messiah could be revealed. And the ceremonial law regulated religious sacrificial system, which anticipated the substitutionary work of the Messiah. And then thirdly, the moral law was the standard of obedience by which believers express their gratitude for divine salvation. Mm -hmm. So we go back to the civil law, again, designed to preserve Israel as a national entity with the coming of Christ, the purpose for, for maintaining the community of Israel as a nation was realized, right? Because now he ushers in the kingdom of God. We are to follow him. We are to be led by him. So the civil injunctions are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Right. The ceremonial law, all of those sacrifices, you know, he goats, rams, and, and uh, tea coats, tea cakes, and turtle doves, and all that stuff, which regulated uh, religious life. After the cross, all of that becomes unnecessary. Right. Because all of it was in anticipation of that ultimate sacrifice, mm -hmm. perfect sacrifice, which was Christ Jesus. Christ, right. And then the moral law, which is the standard of, of, of obedience by which we express our gratitude for, for God's salvation. That moral law has its perfect expression in the person of Jesus the Messiah. He fulfilled the requirements of the law, who at, at bottom line is simply to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Mm. A couple of other things in in this. You, you all mind if I go over today? I, can, I think I can finish. Go <coughs> ahead. Oh, <go here. laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> Time with me. Okay. I'll get you out before 8 30. All right. Okay. Okay. We locked in. Wait, we can't go nowhere. Not <laughs> at all. Go in, right? Right. That's so, true. So there are two things in the mosaic epic that we talked about Passover and the Sabbath, right? Again, the Passover commemorated the divine act of deliverance from bondage, right? With the blood on your doorpost, you pass over. They were. Then instructed once a year to have that 
yeah. That meal, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. They'd eat those bitter herbs, and they'd have that sacrificial <laughs> lamb, right? That's a, yeah. a reminder of their deliverance, right? Right. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, and it's really, you know, it's powerful that when Jesus instituted communion, he did it at the close of the Passover. And they they celebrated Passover in that upper room without uh, <laughs> without the sacrifice. So a lot of them thought when Judas ran out, because he was the banker, that he was running out to go buy the meat. And he did. <laughs> All right. And right. Jesus then that so now you can get the intensity of it where it says, then after they had supped, then Jesus took bread and blessed. We all have a good communion Sunday this Sunday, right? He yeah. took bread, blessed it, and <laughs> break it, and gave it to them and said, This is my body. So he gives them a new uh, commemorative act that commemorates their deliverance from bondage mm -hmm. in his sacrifice of his broken body and shed blood we are delivered from the bondage of sin yeah. so he transforms Passover into a remembrance of what he has done Mm. And then the other one was the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sabbath day was always the last day of the week, right? Sabbath day is Saturday. Day starts on week starts on Sunday. The Sabbath is on uh, Saturday, right? And it's a reminder, you know, just to give you a refresher, it's a reminder that six days God worked, then the seventh. He rested. So what, what they do is on the Sabbath, they look back. Right? Right? They 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 look back at at, at all the work that they were doing or had been doing and they rest is anticipation of so it causes us to look ahead in anticipation of a finished work right so you start the, the week all week looking ahead yeah. yep. to the time when you get to the end of the week when your work is complete thank you lord when jesus rolls on the first day of the week he changed the Sabbath into Sunday, the, uh, our our worship day, instead mm. of the Sabbath, okay. because he did the work already. He did the work first. Right. So, yeah. Now we spent all week long looking back, looking at, back at Sunday at what he already did for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So it, it's kind of a it, it's kind of a again. It's a transformation of those two events in the mosaic epoch into their fulfillment in the apostolic epoch in the work of Jesus Christ. Mm. All right. So he is the perfect atonement for sin. And we talked about this already. So I don't really think I, I'm going to go back through this it, with the day of atonement and the holy of holies, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, 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 the fact of the matter is that Jesus carried his own blood. Think of the, the high priest carrying the sins and carrying the sacrifice, first of all, for his own sin, and then secondly, for the sins of the whole nation into the Holy of Holies and hope that God would accept it and he'd be able to walk out alive. Mm. That's the picture. That's why they tied a rope around it. Because if God didn't accept it, he had to put it out. <laughs> <laughs> you contrast that with the picture of Jesus now carrying his own blood sprinkled on the into mercy. the presence of the Lord in the holy place as payment in full <clears throat> for the sins of the world. 
You know, that's, listen, that, I just got an email a couple of days ago from uh, mm -hmm. my car company saying that, that uh, my lad's car note is just about to be paid. I want to shout hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, Amen. You get it. There's a different feeling when you yeah. know it's been paid in full. in full. Right. Yeah. You get that yeah. note, you pay it every month. Just because you paid it on time that month does not mean you won't have to do it again. <laughs> but when you get to the end of the contract and it's paid in full, it gives you a different feel, right? Yes, yes. Right? So what Jesus does, he carries his blood into that holy place and pays the price of sin in full. And then there's finally the prophetic epoch. Right? And that whole thousand years or so we talked about, there, there are two basic themes running through all those prophecies that I want to lift up that we see clearly in the apostolic epoch. And those two things are the Messiah as king and the Messiah as a suffering servant. Jesus is our kingly Messiah. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, He's what Isaiah talked about. All right. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is all of that. He is He is our King. When Matthew gives us this, this kingly imagery in his gospel. Right. It's interesting when the Magi come looking for Jesus from the east in chapter 2 of Matthew. Right. They come asking the question, where well, is he who is born king of the Jews? All right. <laughs> right. right. All right. Not the guy that sits on the throne occupying and asking. That's Herod. But where is he who is born King of the Jews, we have seen his star, right? right? We know the prophecy. That's basically what they're saying. And we have come to worship him, <laughs> all, right? Mm -hmm. all right? All right. And then when you get to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus spells it out clearly himself. Right, he came to them and spake unto them, saying, All power is All given power. unto me in heaven and in earth. Mm -hmm. If you got all power, you the man. You're the king. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? You're the king of kings and lord of lords. Of lord. Yes, yes. Right. Amen. The second thing that runs through pro the prophetic era is that the idea of the suffering servant. Um, and if you haven't ever read Isaiah 53, I'm not going to read it tonight because you need to go through the whole chapter. Uh, take a good look at it that really references uh, the suffering servant. Yeah. And in Matt, again, Matthew chapter 2, not chapter 20, <laughs> all right, but chapter 2, 25 and 28. Uh, he again reminds us that the Son of Man came to serve. Third, right? Amen. Yep. Right. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Actually, I must. I must have my. I might be chapter one. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't just type something here. Uh, uh, Twenty-five. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 20. It is chapter 20. I just hit a, okay. hit a, I hit a zero. I mean, an O instead of a zero. All right. Okay. Jesus calling to them and saying, I, uh, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion, that's the kingly part, over them, and that they are great and uh, exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be the greatest among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not 
to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for sin. All right? So he comes as a suffering servant so that he can pay our ransom. All right? So he's not a king who exercises dominion over his people. He is the king who serves his people and frees them. And out of our gratefulness for that, we bow to him because and, and acknowledge him as king of kings and lord of all. Right? Okay. And one day the Bible says, every knee, every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I finished it. I finished it. All right. Wonderful. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right. Any questions? Any comments? Very informative. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to give you one week off. <laughs> and then I want to encourage you to join us the last two Wednesdays, Wednesdays of, of February in our Black History workshops put on by our Christian Education Department. Amen. So our our general thrust this year is to have some discussions around the church and justice. So two weeks from tonight, we're going to have a discussion, a panel discussion, and I got some Christian judges who are going to come and share with us they're going to give us their viewpoints and thoughts on the civil rights movement and the role of the church in it. I wanted them to do it. I wanted the judges to do it because they could do it for us from a perspective of justice. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so they'll they'll give us their take on it, and then we'll we'll have uh, about twenty to thirty minutes for uh, maybe about twenty minutes for question and answers from us. It will be on Zoom. Uh, we're going to have Justice Shelvin Louise Marie Hall. We're going to have Judge Carl Boyd. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have Judge Jesse Outlaw, who's on, on Bible class tonight. <laughs> All right. And I think, I'm not sure, I'm waiting for confirmation. I think Judge uh, Hooks, William Hooks, is going to join us as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it will be moderated by Judge Drella Savage. Okay. Once we've dealt with the civil rights movement, civil rights era, we're going to transition the last week in Wednesday to the Black Lives Matter movement. And we okay. want to hear from our young people. Mm. I, I, during the, the marches, uh, during the Black Lives Movement, I, one of the things that really encouraged me, and I've invited these two young ladies uh, to come and speak, is, is that I was always getting instant messages from them asking me questions. Uh, they were out there marching on the front lines, and people were spitting at them, hollering and calling them names, and they wanted to know Reverend. <laughs> what should we do? What is this right? What's going on here? And it was it was gratifying to me that they would, you know, taking up this new mantle and marching that they would reach back and and ask for help from their elders to make sense out of what was going on. Well, I also think that we need to reach toward them so that they can help us make sense out of this movement. And so I've got a few. Uh, I haven't confirmed everybody, but I have confirmed uh, Sister Brianne Burke. That's uh, Mady Bat's granddaughter. Don't know her. And uh, uh, Sister Kirsty Gilmore. Uh, they are two of the four 
that we will have. So I, I'm trying to take this generation, get the younger ones, and then some of that older crowd. I want that 40 crowd in there too. So I want to get two of those. And uh, I haven't uh, firmed them up, or neither have I firmed up my moderator. I'll do that before the week is out. But I, I'm looking forward to a, a good two weeks of discussion from us. Yes. Uh, so we can hear from our young people and we can engage them in dialogue. They can hear from us and we can all work together. Right? Amen. 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 Well, let me thank you all for allowing me to go over a little bit today to, to finish this. And thank you for being faithful for this, this journey. I'll get this up tomorrow. And, uh, and then uh, in the next three weeks, we'll figure out where we're going in March for Bible class. Right? Okay. <laughs> Deacon Ross, you want to close us in prayer tonight? Be only too happy to. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have put into the mind of our pastor that you put over us uh, the, the information that we so badly need in our walk with you. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you have allowed us this time of study. And we ask, Master, that you will continue to undergird all of the work that you have assigned his hand to do. And that as we have studied and have been uh, taught in this session, that we might be able to go out into the world and preach your gospel in the world, that men and women will know there's a reality in serving a true and living God. We ask a blessing on the sick, the afflicted throughout the land and country. And we ask especially a blessing on those that are out in this cold weather this evening in Heavenly Father, that they might be able to find some types of shelters that their bodies will not freeze in this kind of in this weather. We ask the Heavenly Father that you would bless all of those that we are duty-bound to pray for and dismiss us from this session, but never from your presence. All these blessings we ask for my son Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Bless you all. Stay safe. Have a great night. Have a great night. Stay safe and stay warm.